ReZero Starting Life in Another World Volume 9, this time with lovely Emilia on the cover. She is the second character to be featured on a cover twice. Can you guess who the first one is? If you guessed Puck, then you guessed correctly. He appeared alongside Emilia in Volume 1 and Beatrice in Volume 3. Trivia aside, I think this cover is better than the one for Volume 1, it's just cuter in my opinion. Still, I would have preferred a Petal Deuce or a Julius cover. I think this would have been the perfect point in the story to have a Julius cover, but hey, maybe one day. Now, for Volume 9, there's so much to talk about. What an eventful ending to Arc 3. Even the book itself has around 40 more pages than its predecessor, so you know stuff is going down. This volume is probably the biggest roller coaster of emotions up until now. We've had inspirational volumes where Suwaru succeeds, we've had depressing volumes where it's mostly suffering, and this one just gives you the full cocktail of emotions. Volume 9 first fills you up with hype and the sense of achievement, and then it smacks you right in the face with depression once again. The ending of this book is almost like the author is making fun of Subaru and the reader itself. Oh, you thought Subaru was going to be fine just because of Return by Death? Well, think again, silly pants, ha 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 ha. The ending of this book is so evil, it's almost funny. But I'm getting ahead of myself, let's get right into Volume 9, starting with Natsuki Subaru. The volume opens up with Subaru going back to the meeting before they go into Roswell's territory. We as the reader know that Subaru just went through a whole time loop where he fought the witch cult, but I would like to know what the other characters in this meeting are actually thinking. As I've said in previous videos, ReZero is generally speaking written from Subaru's perspective, with an omniscient narrator that is very reserved in the information that he gives away. There are exceptions to this, such as the Ram chapter and the Wilhelm chapter, but those are rare. Here, this is one of those points in the story where I would love to see the story from another point of view to know what the other characters are thinking. This opening scene, if you actually stop and think about it, is very crazy. So this embarrassing teenager Subaru seemingly matured a lot in just a few days, then he knows the location of the white whale, is a crucial part in defeating the white whale itself, seemingly has all of this information about the witch cult that no one can confirm or deny and he can't really state a source, and now all of a sudden he just derps and stares at the background like, Grrr. And now he has a lot more information that he seemingly just remembered. This opening scene is wild. Since we focus so much on the story from Subaru's perspective, we take for granted how crazy this all is. And thankfully for him, the other characters are pretty cooperative, but I would like to know what some of the other characters are thinking internally because they have to be at least a little bit suspicious. Anyway, the plan to take down the witch cult is slightly altered since Subaru is now privy to information he did not have before, such as the blank letter that was sent to the mansion, the fact that the witch cultists have infiltrated the merchants, and that the big bad petal use can possess Subaru himself. Subaru masterfully creates this facade involving various characters, even Puck, Emilia's spirit, in order to fool Emilia and send her away from the danger. And bless her little heart, she believes everything they tell him. She's so naive, it's so cute, it's almost funny. It shows that just like our main character, our main heroine also has a lot to grow, because if she wants to be queen, she can't be this naive. She's so innocent, it's almost childlike. Fairies smartly points out that Emilia can fight the witch cult and would be a valuable asset, but Subaru does not want to make her cry again, because in the previous loop, Emilia, after defeating Petal Deuce, shed a tear, you know, after defeating the crazy cultist that wants to kill her. This plot point will only really make sense in the next arc, so for first-time readers it can be a bit confusing, as Emilia can come off as perhaps overly emotional, which fits the character but is not the actual reason. We get more insight into Emilia's inner dialogue and once again her insecurities are highlighted, as she thinks herself as unworthy of having Subaru by her side and blames herself for the argument they had at the capital. She thinks that since everyone hates her, he would be hated as well by association, and she does not want that for Subaru. In a later moment, when she is entering the carriage with the kids, she assumes they hate her because of her previous experiences with the villagers. This creates a touching moment of her bonding with the kids, since they are more innocent, they have less prejudice towards her, and also Subaru told them that she wasn't a bad person, which goes a long way to help. And in the carriage, she finally realizes that Subaru, the one she can't stop thinking about, is actually the mastermind behind this whole plan. 
Back to Subaru, the plan is a bit different this time. Since he is sending Emilia away, he also has to send someone reliable to protect her, so he ends up sending Wilhelm, one of, if not the strongest member of this group. The thing is, Wilhelm is the only one crazy or masterful enough to counter Petalgeus's unseen hands. So now we are left with the hilariously awkward situation of Subaru having to team up with his rival Julius in order to take down the Archbishop of Slot. Last time Ferris told Subaru that he was avoiding Julius and he took that feedback to heart because this time they are very intimate. So intimate they are even sharing their senses. I'm still talking about volume 9, okay guys? Calm down, calm down. The fight with Betelgeuse is, to me, the highlight of Volume 9. First, even the location itself is poetic, as it's the same spot where Subaru died back in Volume 2. Just the pure cheekiness of Subaru of choosing this spot just makes me smile. Secondly, because only Subaru can see unseen hands, he has to share his senses with one of the people he dislikes the most, Julius, in order for the fight to actually be possible. And Julius, in turn, has to entrust his life to him, one he considered unworthy and beneath him just a few volumes ago. Finally, there's the whole visual theme of the Hands of Darkness of Petalgeus versus the Power of the Rainbow of Julius. I love these little cheesy details, I just love them. To me, it's the rule of cool. And obviously, this is a written medium, so these visual details will come across better in the anime, but it's still pretty epic in the book. This battle is peak shonen, two rivals bonding over a common enemy in the respect they reluctantly have for one another. Subaru calls Julius his mortal enemy and then gives a line that pretty much sums up their relationship. I really hate you, finest of knights. Because of my shame, I know you're one hell of a knight. That's why I trust you. I'm counting on you, Julius. Everything I have, I give to you. And after some funny back and forth, we get the line where Julius finally acknowledges Subaru out loud. With your eyes, I shall strike him down. Subaru Natsuki, my friend. Yeah, this is great. To me, I just love this stuff. I know it's cheesy, but it hits all the right notes for me. I love underdog stories, I love redemption arcs, and I just love a couple of dudes being bros. You know what I'm saying? I love this battle, but the end of it brings the only plot point in the book that I don't really like. So Petalgeus is defeated by Julius and Subaru, and his end is brutal. He gets cut up and stabbed by Julius, damaged by spirit magic, and his body gets crushed under a rock slide. I don't think this is overkill, after all, he is the main villain of Arc 3, and the guy is just pure evil, so he deserved it. But after all of this, he comes back as a vengeful spirit, and I don't really like this. First, you made his death way too gory, so from a narrative standpoint, you can't really top it. It will always be less climactic than the previous battle. My man was cut up, stabbed and crushed under rocks, what corpse is even there to possess? It doesn't even make sense. Secondly, the battle of Subaru and Julius vs Petalgeus was the highlight, it was the narrative and emotional climax of Arc 3. Why not simply end Petalgeus there? It was the perfect moment. Finally, I just don't see the point of this, so Subaru and Otto are being chased by Petalgeus and Subaru just taunts him and then fights him off. There are clearly no stakes here. You know Subaru isn't dying after the epic moment he had with Julius, just like you knew Subaru wasn't going to die and erase the memory he had with Ram back in Volume 6. My main gripe with this is that, in my opinion, it adds nothing to either character or the story. Subaru's grudge with Petalgeus already had closure, and Petalgeus comes off as mad and completely in love with the witch, so things we already knew about him. The only justification I can see for this is that the author perhaps didn't want the climax of the book to be in the middle and just cool down in the second half, so he had to add some stakes and a sense of danger. But that's what the whole Emilia's carriage has a bomb plot point was for. Despite winning the battle, Subaru still has to run after her, risk his life, and finally face Emilia as a changed man. So why bring back Petalgeus into this? It's too much. For me, from a narrative standpoint, it doesn't really make sense and it felt completely unnecessary. While in my eyes it didn't ruin the Julius and Subaru fight versus Petalgeus, which is still epic, it did cheapen it just a little bit because that should have been the epic ending of Petalgeus Romane Conti. Do you agree with me? Am I being too harsh? Leave it in the comments below.
After defeating Petalgeus for the second time, Subaru is not done being a main character because he still has a heroine to seduce. And so he goes after Amelia and contrasting with her dark inner dialogue from before, we get a very soapy but tender moment. I love you, Amelia. Oh my god, he said the thing! Afterwards, they finally talk it out in a very honest and sincere conversation that parallels the one Suwaru had with Rem a few volumes before, except this time, Emilia is the one airing out her inadequacies and insecurities, and Suwaru is the one giving her his unconditional love. So after all this drama, they finally make up and make out. I'm obviously kidding about the makeout part, but after defeating an evil maniacal cult, there's nothing like a good makeout sesh. I'm just saying. Jokes aside, it's very rewarding to see these characters grow and bond together. If ReZero was just a this, I definitely wouldn't read it as it would be way too dramatic and soapy for me, but in the context of the greater narrative, I love seeing these tender moments, and so Arc 3 ends in a happy and loving fashion. Except the book doesn't end here. Remember at the beginning of the video when I said that Volume 9 was a roller coaster of emotions? We've had epic battles, heroic moments, and even a heartfelt reunion between our two main characters. But now, the suffering is back! Strap on, boys, because the paint train is back at full speed! Choo choo! Just a few pages after that heartwarming illustration I just showed you, we get the infamous line from Amelia Who's Ram? Just a single line in a page and chills are sent down the reader's spine. Just what is going on? Turns out, while all this lovely stuff was going on, the detachment that was being sent back to the capital was attacked by these two gentlemen of the witch cult. This attack is devastating. They completely erase Crucia's memories and worst of all, they erase Rem's existence. She is now unconscious, unable to wake up or even speak or do anything and Subaru is the only one who remembers her. To step on the reader's feelings even more, the author gives us this what-if chapter, presumably from Rem's dreams, where Rem and Subaru run away in volume 6 and they now have this cute little family. This is pure suffering, just right in the Kokoro, just stop it man, stop it. The volume should have ended with Subaru and Emilia just making out and being happy, why are you doing this to me, come on man. As if this isn't enough, we find out that Subaru used Return by Death to go back in time, but he goes back to the exact same moment in time. So the past cannot be undone, Rem is gone, and Subaru has no one to share his pain with because no one remembers her except him. And Wilhelm reveals that one of his old wounds has opened up, which somehow means that his dead wife, one of the catalysts behind the whole White Whale debacle, is somehow alive. How? After such euphoria and joy, this is how Volume 9 and Arc 3 end, with our main character crying, powerless to do anything to help the one who helped him the most, stuck in a present he cannot undo. I went off this train, man. The final quarter of this book is nuts. You think you're getting a wholesome and happy ending and all of a sudden the story just you turn straight back into the suffering. So overall, Volume 9. Volume 9 is a roller coaster, man. First it lifts you up and then it throws you on the ground and then it steps on you and steps on you again and then it spits on your unconscious self just for good measure. If somehow you were 8 volumes in and you still weren't convinced that ReZero is peak fiction, then this should do it because Volume 9 is amazing. I may be a bit of a masochist, I don't know, but I love this volume, the good, the bad and the ugly. Besides the whole Petal Goose coming back, which I've already addressed, it felt completely unnecessary to me, I love this volume from beginning to end. It's either tied with or slightly above volume 7 as one of my favorite volumes up until now. For my MVP of volume 9, I would vote for the author's twisted sense of humor, but since that isn't the character, I will vote for Julius, although I think this one's a bit of a given. From arrogant asshole to slightly less arrogant asshole who recognizes Subaru as a friend and also has a peculiar sense of humor and the self-awareness that is unexpected of him. In addition, a complete prodigy at third person hack and slashes. Who would have guessed? Julius Juculius, the finest of knights, my MVP for volume 9. This was all for me today folks, if you liked this video be sure to leave a like and subscribe, maybe even comment, who knows? And I will see you guys for Volume 10 and Arc 4. Bye bye.